Vadim, it's good to see you. Hey, Sandro, Charo, it's been a while. Indeed, it has. I can only stay for a little bit, though, and then I have to go to another meeting. Aww. Such is life. Does it make, does it make sense, then, to do CRC's stuff earlier in the meeting? So that you no, can... actually, I'd prefer for you to save it till after I leave. <laughs> <laughs> Just for that, it'll be at the beginning. Right, yeah. exactly. Let me take a look at yeah. what we've got. Here. But Vadim has my update for me. <laughs> It's about halfway through, but we'll, we'll, you know, basically there's, the short of it is there's people who are ready to take it on. There's like five different people that are interested in forming a little subgroup. To maintain That's it. fantastic. All right, let's get started with uh, the meeting. So, uh, Vadim, go ahead and uh, give us the latest on uh, release updates. Like How about now? Thank you. There we go. Much better. Yep. Uh, so um, there hasn't been much happening in our releases, mostly because we're blocked on, well, multiple ways. Um, the most pressing issue was uh, that Fedora OS has regressed and stable and testing devel. Uh, there was a file. So there was a bug filed for Fedora Quest streams related to uh, Network Manager and some weird system deciding which prevents it from booting when we pass the master ignition. Um, the fix for this is to revert back to the older Fedora Quest table that is one from um, May or from June. I have updated all the nightlies for, for 8, for 9, and for 7. And uh, on CI for seven still fails on vSphere, so we would need um, manual confirmation before we cut out a new stable release that fully working, or we need to look into something more. Um, this is one of the reasons why we didn't cut the release um, two weeks ago, so that we would make sure. Um, another news is that. Kubernetes would be rebased in for eight and for seven uh, branches. We're waiting for the final tags to be added to the PRs, and hopefully it would make it into the nightly and we'll cut a new for seven release based on 120, uh, 120 I think. Um, the largest problem is probably that we still don't have a safe upgrade path from for seven to for eight. First of all, there are multiple issues and regressions in cryo, which are supposed to be fixed and we'll get them in the new release, which are affecting OCP as well. And in our case, uh, we have a bug with OVM team where the applications are still getting disrupted more than we expect them to. This is why the CI cannot create an upgrade pass and we have no annual way to, to override this. So we will have to wait or uh, come up with an actually a manual way and uh, some known issue that your obligations might be disrupted about like 10% of all the time, although our target is uh, less than 1%. Um, there has been progress on uh, bare metal API. Um, we created a, an OKD specific version for ironic IPA downloader, I think, and we have. Uh, Great chat with the uh, bare metal team, and I think we had a progress on the actual ironic image, so we would need to land it. Uh, we would need to land a pull request and a promotion PR in release uh, repo, and we should have all the bits and pieces necessary in uh, for the night list. Once we confirm that all of these are ready, we can port them back to 4.8 and 4.9. And, 4 and um, Another interesting issue with Fedora was that they have changed the SE Linux profile rules, which led to two Kubernetes tests failing. We have a pull request to actually fix that, but until then, we cannot upgrade 
Selenix, prof uh, Selenix targeted packages in our Fedora OS, which leads to inability to update glibc, which leads to inability to update a bunch of packages. One of them is uh, Network Manager 132. So at this point, we have to revert back to Network Manager 130, which has an issue with reverse pointer uh, resolutions. So it's an unfortunate casualty while we figure out um, things with upstream and how to land the fixes and take them back to 4.7. So that's something I will uh, write a known issue about um, when we cut out a new stable release. Um, I think I mentioned that, that we have a pull request in uh, upstream. Mustafa is looking into this, and I'm hoping it would land fairly soon because general folks are agree on the approach and matter of clicking the buttons. Um, and I believe that's all I have for today. Excellent. Any questions on uh, what uh, Vadim uh, covered there? Anyone have any questions or comments on what he had? Looks like we're good for that. Thank you, Vadim. Moving on to Timothy with uh, Fedora Core OS updates. Uh, actually, sorry, uh, I have a small oh. question. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Uh, just that on, on the on the various uh, releases uh, under the upgrades from section. Um, there are uh, sometimes some individual letters, you know, F or S, which presumably means something failed or succeeded, and uh, occasionally there are four of them, sometimes there are three of them, and I haven't been able to find anywhere what those actually mean. Um, well, yes, F means failed, S means succeeded, B right, is for pending. What failed? Uh, the exact job, so I have to start them manually, I think I covered this previously, but I can get more into detail. So the way we create an upgrade path is actually make CI run an upgrade from one release to the other. Um, there is some automation which runs upgrades from previous nightly to the latest nightly, but there is no automation which runs uh, this same sort of jobs on stable branches. So I have to pick these myself. Usually I'm guided by uh, latest two releases and the most popular for six from telemetry. But so if you need yeah, no, if no, you need a specific fine. yeah if you need a specific stuff just uh, ping me I can run a job but right I can no, no, start no, it but uh, I no thank you Vadim uh, with three of them I re I originally guessed it was like AWS uh, or you know something like, like that but um, like individual jobs and I can probably go like the, in that case the uh, the ch the change log makes a bit more sense so thank you yeah I'm trying to split them between AWS and GCP just cover all the platforms um we probably could try a vSphere upgrade but the pass rate would be very low um again all of that is done half manually at least I invoke those jobs I cannot affect them once they have started so if you need a specific edge or to try out a specific platform, sure, it can be done. Thank you. All right. Let's, is any other questions or comments? All right, let's move on then to the Fedora Core OS updates. Thank you. Hi, I'm Thibaut Ravier from the Core OS team at Red Hat, uh, working on Fedora Core OS mostly. Um, so I've linked several issues. So the, one of the big thing we fixed recently uh, uh, is around the UEFI booting, especially the live ISO. If you had troubles in the past booting the live ISO, uh, it should now be fixed in Fedora Core OS. Uh, so I don't know, well, the exact versions are linked into a ticket. I don't know how that impacts um, OKD directly, but probably for the for the first boot up node, it will have an impact for the first boot. Um, and we still have one in progress uh, regarding uh, my firmware's configuration. 
which is if we if you had issues like uh, when reinstalling nodes um, on with Fedora Chorus, uh, and in the past if you had some kind of issues, and uh, probably this is uh, something you've hit before, so take a look and uh, chime in if you have any. Any, any anything to to add on the discussion? Uh, suppose live ISO type of trees. So it's essentially the live ISOs are uh, live versions of the records. So it's essentially a live system, a fully live system for the records running uh, from an ISO. Put it just put it from an ISO, either be it like a real disk or uh, you if you write your ISO onto a, a USB stick or whatever, uh, it boot up from that. Um, yeah, so that's one of the issues we fixed recently and one in progress. Uh, another thing in progress that is coming up uh, is per platform console defaults changes. So the, the goal is we're working on making it possible to have per platform uh, different uh, console default console configuration per platform. So that would make sure that on AWS, you get the the version of the console that you need to get on AWS. Uh, and on bare metal, you get the version of the console that works best in bare metal and things like that. And for each different platform, uh, we'll have uh, different defaults. And this is uh, this is work in progress. So it's not there yet, but if you have like anything interesting, if you, you think that we should use a specific version of uh, of the specific configuration for the console uh, for uh, bare metal or whatever uh, feel free to chime in into the issue uh okay so like so that's like two biggest items uh then we have a couple of deadlocks and uh a couple of issues with the kernel in fedora that have been reported to us so that might be of interest to uh, if you encounter those, uh, hopefully you won't yet because you don't probably don't have the same kernel yet on on OKD. So I'm just thinking there, then there in case you have something that looks like this and you can chime in too. Um, and uh, yeah, and I forgot we are really really close to have a H uh, a Arch 64 artifacts now. Uh, so we, we essentially have them available. Uh, it's you don't have like the nice download page and everything on the website, but it's there and it's, it should be working. So uh, right now we have testing release. I don't think we have a stable release yet. Oh yeah, maybe we have a do we have a stable test. Maybe we already have one. Yeah, we just have one uh, right now. So we have just had one stable uh, release for HR64, so you should be able to try them. Uh, we have AWS AMIs, we have bare metal, we have a lot of stuff, uh, open stock images, uh, all. So yeah, ARC64 is definitely coming to Fedora CoreOS. It's there. Uh, yeah, and the remaining uh, things are mostly cosmetic, like make sure that it's listed on the website and, and things like that. So that's just coming up right away. Um, so yeah, let's just link this one there into, oh, I've already linked it. No. Uh, builds are there. I'm updating the notes at the same time to make sure I don't forget. Oops, where it is. And the okay, and um, one last item that I want to point out uh, point out is uh, if you have only fiber channel um, or fiber channel over Ethernet uh, connections uh, on bare metal nodes, for example, you might currently have no way to get a network any network working. Uh, we, have lo we are looking into that to see if we need to add uh, by default, well, including the image, uh, any other utilities to make fiber channel fully working on Fedora Core S. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, if 
you interested in that, if that's something that's just interesting, interesting for you in your use case on Demital mostly, uh, again, feel free to chime in and, uh, and we'll um, on the discussion. And that should be it for me. I think that's like the top items from uh, Fedora Chorus uh, from the last two weeks. We've got a couple questions uh, yeah. in the chat channel. Okay. Neil, do you uh, want to just go ahead and, and articulate your questions for people watching the video? Uh, okay, sure. Um, you mentioned the FCAUSE supports um, live ISO stuff. I didn't know that that was a thing. Does it support like hybrid persistence type stuff as well? Like if you put it onto a USB stick that um, VAR home would automatically be provisioned in the remaining space and you could use it? So it's it's not automatically done, but you can do it. Uh, so if either you reuse the space you have on the USB stick, but it's probably not what you want, but most probably you want to do, what you want to do is use the disk on the system to like persist data. So basically slash var essentially, and you can do that. So the live ISO is a fully, uh, Fully working Fedora Chorus environment and it is running ignition. So if uh, on first boot, so if uh, if you want to configure the live ISO via ignition, it's perfectly possible. It's supported and uh, it will do. And uh, so if you want, like say, run start your live ISO, you can even like embed ignition 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 configs into the ISO and it will uh, be picked up uh, by ignition at first boot and then applied. And so let's say you want to partition slash bar and put slash bar on the persistent disk and keep running the live ISO as a as a fresh and fresh and like uh, ephemeral environment, you can do that. And uh, let's say when you reboot, then you will get the live ISO again. So you have to figure out like an, another way to do updates uh, in this case, if you use it like that, the, the main use case for that kind of stuff, uh, the, that, that kind of way of working is PXE booting. Well, where you just like, you update the version of Fedora Chorus directly on the server and you reboot your nodes and they just simply reboot into the new version. I see. So it's for bare metal provisioning, basically. Yeah, you... You can either use it to provision Bermuzel to install Fedora Chorus onto nodes uh, because you have a fully working environment and you can run Chorus install manually there or automatically via ignition or you or kernel arguments directly uh, pro, uh, uh, pro, provided to, to, to the kernel to the, on, the, on the command line uh, during the live ISO boot up. Or you you can directly use that as uh, as an environment. It's 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 possible. Uh, but yeah, it's probably better used. Well, better fitted for your bare metal use case. You're right. Excellent. And any other further questions or comments about that? Let's move on now to Doc's update. Uh, Brian, go ahead and uh, take it away. Okay, <clears throat> so we've been working on <clears throat> updating OKDIO. Um, if anyone has actually tried to update the main site, you'll understand that it's not trivial and the learning curve to understand the various packages that make up that. Um, you really do need to be a full um, front-end developer to actually achieve that. So what we've done is we've, and let me actually share, we've actually set up um, a, a beta branch. Can you see that? Yep. yep. Okay, yes. we've actually set up a beta branch within the main repo. Um, and this has now been switched over to use mkdocs. And you'll see there's a link on the side, which actually takes you to the beta site. So this is being rendered using GitHub pages. And on a GitHub push, you get all of the automation to build and update the site. So when we accept um, a, 
uh, pull request or a commit onto the branch, it will actually automatically update um, the documentation. So there's no infrastructure needed within um, Red Hat or anywhere else. Um, the site is fully marked down. So even the, the home page now is being fully marked down. It means that we don't have all the fancy animations that's on the current site, but in terms of updating it, it is much simpler. We also have a much better navigation where we've got the high level site navigation here on the left and an in page navigation on the right. So you can just click and navigate round based on the headings one, two, and three. This is all sort of automated. Um, if I look at the site, it's fully, fully um, responsive. So if I come onto a phone, you'll see that the menus vanish and they sort of switch up to here and I can get to the in page navigation. Um, so it's a fully responsive design. Um, it also will flick between light and dark mode depending on your browser. Um, if your system settings allow that, whenever you open it, it should adopt to whatever your, um, your, your system settings are. So the basic site is there. Um, I'm not precious about this. If anybody thinks there's a better color scheme, or anything like that. Um, it's fantastic. It is. It's fantastic, and I think we can live without the animation. <laughs> okay. I um, the only thing that I think honestly, the only thing that would make it better is if we got rid of the weird gradient background that's behind some of the imagery, because ironically, it makes it less readable. Like if you go okay. look at the at the title where you see um, there, it says community distribution that powers Red Hat OpenShift. Like yep. it's actually a little hard for me to read it because of the the background reducing the contrast. Okay, I put this in. I mean, the home page is got some custom templates just to make mm -hmm. it a little bit. So I know Diana was very keen to keep her Rocket Man in. So no, the Rocket uh, Man's fine. I, I just really have a problem with the Man. weird bubbly yep. hexagony background pattern thing. Yeah, which is which, which is just from the old site. I'm happy to take that out. Um, yeah. I just other than that, it is to, solid. I just wanted to add a little bit more um, interest rather than having solid. You'll see that as we get into the um, if we get into the main site, we lose all of that. So it just becomes so for yeah, example, it becomes these, normal. These are the guides. So if we look at say Vadim's, um, we've got his oh man pictures. Yeah. So it's all there. This is and again, great. You've got navigation. The search, again, I can type vSphere and it, it just pops up. And then these are all the places vSphere um, appears. So we have a, a sort of a, an automatic search index on the site as well. So if you want to find stuff. And what I have done in the community section, if you're interested, I started putting documentation about how the markdown. We use standard markdown, but we also use an extension library, so we can do things like have these sort of information boxes. We can put tabs in, so you can see that we, we can actually switch tabs and just add a little bit more um, control and information. Um, tables, code blocks, we can actually put line numbers in or leave it out. It's got the copy paste automatically in there. The other thing I've done is I've added a spell checker. So whenever we push something, we automatically do a full spell check and it is set to US English. So I know you guys use your simplified version of English, not real English. Um, but I, oh. have, I, have gone, <laughs> I have gone and adopted US English as the standard default. So everybody needs to sort of use US English. Um, if you want to, on a page, you can actually put a comment in, which you can add words. So if you've got technical words, you can add them in to pass a spell checker. It will not publish if there's spell checking errors or if there is link checking errors. The other thing we do is a full link checker on publish. So again, we should never have broken links or bad spelling within the content. So it's there, go play with it. As I say, it's in the beta branch on, on, on the main GitHub repo. I'm now looking at the content and trying to sort of 
beef up the content and um, get there. One thing that we've talked about is on the um, install page, maybe moving some of the content from the OKD README. So this is on the OKD main repo. There's some quite useful information within the README there. And some of this we think should be part of the OKD documentation rather than being in this README. So um, there we go. That's that's it. Yeah, I wanted to actually loop Vadim in on this. So Vadim, uh, the README from the repo has sort of a, a mix of a lot of different uh, uh, aspects, right? So installation and um, the releases, uh, nightlies, uh, and stuff like that. So the thought was that we would break this up a little bit and make the read the readme more of just a true readme of this is the project, and then have links to the various OKD.io web pages for those particular topics. Is do you have any concerns about that? This has been kind of your uh, no. That sounds. That sounds very good. I'm just not sure which site do people first encounter. Do they look for OKD.io or do they go to GitHub and figure out that it's OKD? So I think there should be some text, very brief description on both sites so that people would not get confused. Okay. Uh, but other than that, we definitely should have flowed a bunch of text from README. It's way overloaded. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Any other questions or comments uh, for Brian? And this is awesome work, man. Awesome. Absolutely fantastic. Hey, Brian, what's your sense uh, in terms of timeline? You think a month, two months? Oh, I'm thinking a fortnight. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that I mean, for it's... everyone else who doesn't know what that word means. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, because I mean, I think the sooner that we can actually make this move, I'm hoping people will pick up the sort of banner and actually contribute content. I mean, for example, the COC, we can actually move it, move into here as well. I mean, I actually do have COC section in there, but I, I think that we can actually add and make this a much more dynamic site. Hopefully, it's easy enough to use now. So, if we have like a, a headline on build x is broken please use a previous version we could actually put that on the front page and have sort of like a headline section and it can be updated almost weekly as we need to and as people get stuck and they figure it out they can just go and throw something on the site because it's really simple to do now um there's no sort of steep learning curve and um, i think mike appreciated just how horrible it is adding content with his guides <laughs> Um, so hopefully it all just makes sense and, and it's easy now. But yeah, I'm hoping to have the core of the reorganization and in the, in the, in the pages in place within the next two weeks. So then we can maybe this call in two weeks' time, people can have a look through and actually make, make take the decision, needs more work, or let's switch it live now. I think a primary thing will be getting that README parsed out and that text that Vadim mentioned. That's going to be a necessity. Uh, and once we have that, I think it's safe to to do the other stuff sort of as needed. Yeah, Brian. Cool. Bruce, go yeah. Ahead. yeah, yeah. No, it looks looks fantastic, uh, and I'm really happy that uh, you know you made this switch. Uh, we we might consider at like at a lower level of priority after the substance that people were talking about earlier. Um, we should make sure that we get the color scheme reasonable because when I look at it, it your sort of lighter background in in the uh, the middle looks like it has sort of a bluish tinge to it, and then the highlights are red, and the sort of red blue is the worst on the eyes. You know, the human eye can't focus simultaneously on both red and blue because they're opposite ends of the spectrum. So I'm just saying that we might look at the the color balance and the accents and things like that as a, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to defer that to the docs working group. Yeah, I say, I say I'm, I'm not precious. I just pick colors that were on the existing site, and, and a lot of thought didn't go into it. So I'm very happy for people to 
to go go and make changes or suggest changes. Yeah. Oh sure. Well, I guess from the Red Hat side, you know, we like red, but uh, that doesn't mean that we should destroy everybody's eyes, you know, in in the process. Yeah. So we well, can... we can use the colors uh, incorporated uh, into the Rocket Man, right, and just sort of. Uh... But and I'm guessing the like is it is it uh, themed is is there like I I haven't looked at how hard it's changed the uh, the template for colors. I've broken them all out so it's really easy. Um, if, if you go and look at the um, there's a CSS folder and the docs folder it's, it's in right. there. And we, I, so every color's got a CSS variable name against it so we can just go and change them. And there's a switch for changing right so that people we we need to let people know right. that that's there. Um, all right, I do want to move on because we do have uh, a full agenda and some, we have some guests here. Um, so I need to get through uh, some of the other things that we've got. Um, real briefly, um, the, uh, I'm noticing in the channels that there's a lot of folks asking questions without providing a lot of context. Does anyone, I asked this in the docs group and folks weren't really sure, is there like a Kubernetes based how to ask questions document that you're aware of? Like I know there's that one site that's been around for years that's like how to ask questions. But does anyone know of a good text that we can point to or build upon about how folks should ask questions when they are um, you know, seeking help in the channels or in a discussion item or in a... Vadim started to put some stuff together which was really helpful. Um, and if Maybe we'll just put that into a document if if we don't know of anything else. Yeah, just for information, I do plan to have that page on okd.io so we can actually use Excellent. that as a way to point people. Excellent. Very cool. Um, it doesn't sound like there's a Kubernetes specific page, so I think we'll just build on what Vadim has, and the docs uh, working group can tackle that next week. Um, we'll just add those items. Vadim came up with a list uh, a couple of weeks ago. We'll just put those items together and then put that in a, a format that can be put into the description of the Slack channel. Uh, and then at the top of the Google, uh, well, in the Slack channel, and then we're going to change the Google group to actually point to um, the discussion section. And then in the discussion section, we can put that uh, there uh, and, and have folks provide that information in the video. that can be done. And there's templates in the discussion section as well, right? I'm, there are, you can have templated answers, but I don't think these are shared across all org, at least. I have a list of mine, okay. and I'm not sure how to share them. Like, these are saved in my account. Um, okay. GitHub might be weird. Okay. All right, just wanted to throw that out there. Docs group will talk about that a little bit more. Um, and uh, training materials for docs support resource. Um, that was basically docs about docs. Uh, and so we answered that a little bit at the last docs meeting. Um, and we'll be talking more about that uh, at this next meeting. Um, repo issues, is there anything that people want to pull out of the repo to discuss real quick uh, from the issue section of the repo? Any actual issues? Vadim, I know you've been pushing a lot of stuff to discussion because a lot of it was discussion oriented and you covered a lot of issues uh, at the beginning here, but anything you want to bring to our attention? No, I think I haven't seen anything super interesting or at least which something which can be covered with a log bundle. Um, I wanted to discuss the whole procedure. When I learned that GitHub has discussions, I was thinking that would be a great place to figure out what this issue is about, and then you can move it back to issues. Now it turns out GitHub has a label called bug, and if you mark it as a bug, that will give you a brand new tab outside right nearby between issues and discussions, and it's gonna be a dedicated place for bugs. So you can have three places where you can figure out if it's a bug or not. Um, I don't know if I should go on with moving issues to discussions or should we keep them as issues and just mark them as bugs? Uh, my head's spinning on this, honestly. Yeah, what do folks think? Oh. I'm surprised that there's not going to be a third 
Yeah, uh, that's a new I'm one. curious what their thought process is for doing that. It's probably because a lot of people use the issues with a bug label or something like that anyway. So they're thinking, oh, let's make it easier for them. But we kind of came up with our own thing in the meantime. I don't know. Honestly, like, I've been keeping an eye on the discussion sections and watching what Vadim moves in there. A lot of it isn't really like a bug bug, you know? It's not like, uh, it's just a bunch of people over and over having trouble deploying their clusters, which is understandable because it's really hard, but it kind of illustrates, like, how far we have to go here. My so idea was that my idea was that if we figure out that it's an actual Fedora Core bug in a discussion, we close the discussion and reopen the bug. But this happened like maybe twice. Apparently, yeah. that's not the way to go. Right, well, yeah, that was, like conversely, a, bug be a curated oh, bug. Like not everybody should be able to say that it's a bug. Right, like like to me, like the, the normal usage that I used to see is that. Uh, anybody can raise an issue, and then after discussion, you decide whether or not it's a bug. And then I guess a discussion would then be something that people don't even think is an issue. It's just they want to talk about things, maybe propose new things or, or whatever. So uh, I, I could see having those three categories, but definitely we would have to tell people how to use them. I don't think we, they would intuit that. <laughs> So we have about I just, 20. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, conversely to what Vadim was saying about like Fedora core OS bugs, you know, if we surface bugs in OpenShift components, like <clears throat> those bugs need to get brought back into like bugzilla.redhat or somehow need to make it to the components. Because I can guarantee you that aside from like Vadim and myself and probably anyone else on this call, none of those OpenShift engineers are looking at the OKD like issues list. <laughs> It, it is also hard to figure out because oftentimes I do notice that a lot of bugs that I run into personally already have, are tracking and being fixed, but it's very hard to figure that out from the outside looking in. And that I don't think that's necessarily related to here, but I think other people are having that problem as well. We could probably go a lot further to closing a lot of these things out quickly if we had some way, us as external people, not just you know those of us inside of the Red Hat bubble, to uh, be able to triage that kind of stuff. Well, right, and if we could teach, you know, like I don't know, I don't know how to bridge this gap. I'm still, you know, I, this is still an, a question I would like to see answered. It's like, if we could teach the community, you know, how to get more, you know, communication with like the Red Hat people who are working on OCP, you know, I know that like if these, if there were bugs getting into Bugzilla and that's a, you know, I, I know we're migrating to Jira in the future and everything, but if we had bugs going into that pipeline, then you would have people responding more quickly, at least from people who are working on the code. I think now it's just there's this gap that we need to kind of like, you know, fill up. Okay, I want to table this discussion because uh, we've got 20 minutes left and we have a guest and we have a couple of other important items that I want to do. But let's put this on the agenda for the next meeting and try to come up with an actual plan for how to move folks around um, Vadim, do you know of a resource for must understanding and parsing must gather? Like if we can, if we can get more people understanding how to work with must gather, then we might be able to um, get through these things that get posted much better. I don't think we have a guide where to look first in the must gather. There are, however, a bunch of tools centered around action was gathers, which you just did it, and it gives you a very short gist of what's happening. But then it depends on, on uh, basically specific component, like API server issues are very broad. It can be audit, it can be just simply partner starting. So uh, for a start, you can have, I think we have a short guide. I'll try to find it and, well, open source it just like we should have. Um, All right, I didn't want to spend I mean, too much time on that, but I think I noticed there's a lot of stuff that if uh, if we can get through the must gathers, if community members can get through the must gathers, we could save Vadim and a lot of other folks a lot of time, uh, and and we're 
concisely answer people, I think. Uh, okay, I'm going to breeze through these really quick. Um, uh, Can I ask a quick items? question about the musk gathers? Yeah, sure. Like, I don't, I don't know if this is ever something the community would accept, but like, is it like, would it ever be possible for us to create the kind of service where someone could like make a must gather and be able to like drop it in a place where we could review it? We can't do that, but anyway. Okay. GDPR and CCPA is would kill us basically. That's for okay. starters. So even if we ask people like up front to like you know to, to upload their content or whatever with some sort of proviso. That doesn't get us out of like GDPR and whatnot. Yeah, because they are uploading and they are controlling the results. They have to upload it to some server that which they right. can take out. Right. Um, All right. Well, let's cool. let's Thanks. move on because I, I do want to get to this other stuff. Um, the user questionnaire. The the group decided to uh, the docs group decided a user questionnaire would be great. And um, at this meeting, we talked about it last time. And so, user questionnaire is up and posted. Um, uh, Driti uh, posted uh, a response with some great suggestions. If other folks can chime in, um, the goal is to get the survey out to OKD users. What's missing? What is the you know their biggest roadblocks? What do they like the most, etc. So check that out. Um, Code Ready Containers subgroup. Uh, we've got Neil, Daniel, Driti, uh, myself, Charo, Brian, and anyone else want to be on that? Anyone else? on the call who wants to be part of that subgroup uh, that's uh, helping maintain uh, code ready containers? Put your name in the chat or speak up. Okay, Bruce is interested as well. Okay, we'll add your name. Uh, okay, very cool. And we're in the process of navigating that out. Basically, I think Neil and, and Daniel are gonna be sort of the leads on this uh, and um, yeah, it looks like we got a fair amount of people that are interested, so that's awesome. And that's that was Diane's measure of success for the subgroup was that there were people interested to maintain it. Uh, Vadim answered the operator questions. Uh, please check those out. Um, we won't go over them here, but there's some uh, clarity about operators, and we'll talk about that at the next meeting. Um, new business was a migration path outline. Would it be possible, Vadim, for us to create a simple table that we could direct people to? Because it seems like a lot of questions are, can I up, upgrade from this version to this version, et cetera? Is it too complex for that, or do you think we'd be able to pull it off? Um, for OCP, we have a full-blown service which gives you an upgrade path. For OKD, it's a bit untrivial. I mean, if you can parse JSON manually, we have an endpoint, but the visualizing this is a bit tricky. Okay. Um, although I think we have like a static dot type diagram, which can give you the edges because we don't use any uh, channels. That's much easier than OCP. Um, but yeah, visualization of this upgrade pass is always a tricky question. Um, I think I think I can find this diagram which can be rebuilt dynamically. Um, okay. I'll put uh, an action item for myself. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so now I want to move on to uh, our guest Sandro, uh, who is here to uh, talk a little bit. Um, uh, and did anyone else show up, or is it just you? Uh, Or which topic? Uh, so was it you who's going to talk? Who's going to talk about uh, Kubevert? Who's here for talking about Kubevert? Did they so, show up? Uh, there are a few people here. It's me, Michal, and Fabian Deutsch here. Uh, okay. I would suggest to get Fabian introducing the subject. Okay. All right. Well, our, our discussion item is because of um, a desire for OKD to be more stable for um, the switch to Kubert uh, for virtualization, the upstream of Red Hat's virtualization offering. And um, we received an email about, uh, about that and invited folks to come here and talk about it. Is anyone here? Yeah, I see that. 
I see that Fabian dropped it. Um, okay. So you probably <clears throat> know that uh, within OpenShift, uh, we are shipping OpenShift virtualization and uh, um, we have uh, not really a fully integrated solution corresponding to that based on OKD. We started trying to get uh, Covert running on top of uh, uh, OKD a uh, while ago and things are improved. Uh, over the past few months and now we would like to to see if there is interest in uh, getting things more integrated and make covert like a special interest group within the okd project uh, providing virtualization on top of okd i'd like to see that for sure like uh it it's a very interesting uh thing to me and I think one of the bigger weaknesses of Kubernetes as a whole is you know how poor it is at at doing you know what people tend to expect for virtualization so I feel like overt and and OKD are complementary in this regard and and bringing them closer together can only lead to a better solution so the thought would be that there would be like a a subgroup like a working group a sub working group that would focus on this with so maybe some Red Hat folks and some OKD folks? Is that what the general thinking is? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, the idea is to get the community involved in this process and getting more closer to um, providing something that can be tested by the, for example, for the over community uh, to see what's the future and getting more on touch on what will happen, uh, for example, with uh, Rev and uh, OpenShift virtualization. It, it will help uh, getting more understanding about uh, the differences and uh, the possibilities that OKD can provide them in that area. Excellent. Uh, is, is this let's work on multiple sort of different backgrounds? Because obviously OKD works on cloud. I mean, I think we've got a fairly large vSphere population. Um, I, I run overt, but I think majority um, tend to run vSphere. And then obviously we got some bare metal. What is the dependency on the underlying platform on the on the virtualization layer? I would expect that people that want to run virtualization on top of OKD are going to install on bare metal. So that's the, the expectation. Uh, despite, I think that also running on nested virtualization will work uh, with one level of nesting. Um, I think that there's nothing really specific that we require from the OKD installer for that. So it'll be okay. Yeah, the, the other thing is that um, I remember reading this in the OpenShift documentation. I don't know if this is still true, but if you pair um, OpenShift Container Platform uh, running the OpenShift Virtualization Module on top of Red Hat Virtualization, uh, you can still orchestrate VMs from the OpenShift interface. They just get provisioned through um, Rev. And so that means that you yeah. get a second, you get the ability to do direct virtualization management through the OpenShift API um, for for Rev, so you get an open stack, cloudy, superscalar type um, provisioning API combined with the more traditional virtualization uh, resource management um, interface and API of Overt with one solution. So, yeah, we got a, a Nova conference today, and uh, Gal Zeidman from my team. Uh, presented uh, the integration between OKD and Dovirt uh, in these terms. So uh, I added a link to the agenda to, to that presentation and I would suggest to have a look. Uh, the integration works pretty well. Um, so I think that on that side, we are already in a good point. Uh, here, the, um, the proposal is kind of different. It's not really having OKD more integrated to OVIRT, but providing an alternative to OVIRT itself. 
which is running Kubert on top of OKD. Yeah, my my understanding too though is like with Kubert, especially if we if we're able to like use that as the catalyst or whatever the substrate, um, then you can run you could run OpenShift on OpenShift basically, right? Oh my God, I don't want to think about that. Um, the uh, the the only real problem I you know. Actually, it's not the only real problem, but the biggest problem with OpenShift virtualization, at least from my perspective, like I've played with it a little bit at some demos and whatnot, um, is that it's too hard to work with. Um, like it is extremely alien to someone who's more used to like how the overt UI works and how virtual machines tend to be managed that way, how provisioning works with that. Um, like. I, I would class um, OpenShift virtualization closer to OpenStack rather than closer to Overt. Whereas like say something along the lines of, um, what's it called, Harvester. Harvester is closer to Overt than it is to OpenStack in terms of how virtual machine management works. And they're both using Kubevert. Um, so like at least having used Overt and OKD, like I, if I wanted to move from Overt to OKD, I think a prerequisite would be some kind of UX migration that makes it so people who are working that way can still continue to function in an OpenShift world. And I don't think we're there yet. Maybe we will be someday, I don't know, but um, that that's really the big gap that I see is that people who work the VMware uh, over Rev style of virtual machine stuff basically have no home in OpenShift virtualization. Okay, uh, let's see if we have any questions that were there. Nope, mostly discussion in the discussion. Um, I just, yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah. Oh, go ahead, sorry, Jimmy. Oh, I, wanted, well, I just I wanted to add a side note about some of the tech behind this too, if people are curious. Oh, so like, um, you know, in OpenShift now, we have a Kubevert uh, cloud provider, or, you know, like machine API provider that we've been working on for a while. I'm not sure how up to date that is, but recently um, Apple has come to the cluster API community and they've put a lot of people behind trying to create a cluster, a full cluster API provider for Kubevert. Um, and I know that our Red Hat team that's been working on Kubevert is now like kind of linking up with some of these Apple people to help maybe see if we can bridge the gap between the machine API provider that we have now for Kubevert and what Apple wants to do in the, yeah, yes, Neil, Apple, um, wants to do with Kubevert in the upstream. I Like, so in the cluster API project, it seems that Apple is very curious about building and automating clusters of Kubernetes on top of Kubevert you know, Kubernetes clusters, basically. And so they want to they put a lot at, into that. And I know that they had been looking at the OpenShift machine API provider because that was the only thing out there for a while, but it's very OpenShift specific. It doesn't work with the cluster API pieces. So another kind of interesting tidbit to this that I think will probably bear a lot of fruit over the next year or so. Do you think that the, I can't believe I'm saying this, do you think the Apple folks? might be interested in coming with us in OKD to try these kinds of things. Cause like if we're heading down this direction, it would be interesting to have them involved to like sync up and collaborate to like working with the Red Hat OCP folks, you know, the Kubevert folks at the Red Hat teams and like, you know, generally like making OKD and OpenShift um, work this way for them. And yeah, I mean, that that's a great question, Neil. Like, I, I talked with some of the Apple folks, and I talked with some of the Red Hat folks, and basically made some introductions and tried to hook them up, because I don't work on Kubert, like, specifically. My impression is that Apple is really curious to get this cluster API provider running, and they would love to have Red Hat's help working on it. So I know those two groups are, you know, there's some communication happening there. Um, I, I don't have my nose in the middle of it to know really if, like, could they be? Could Apple be convinced to do this all on OKD or something like that? Would be really cool. Do you still have those contacts where you could? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, Apple's still come into the cluster API. Like, I could continue this conversation with them and see if we can maybe convince yeah. them to just, come just here mention, or something. Just, just to see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, see if they're interested. Let's, let's do that. As much as my brain hurts a little bit from all thinking right. about this, yeah. The all right, we've got three minutes left, so let's do a sub working group on this. 
I think it would, it's, it would be great to have a sub working group on this. Um, we'll get the Red Hat folks, Sandro, anyone else that's interested, and then folks here, okay, D folks, I'll send something out over the working group, uh, Google group um, email list, and uh, then we'll get volunteers for that and actually um, solidify this as a project. So I think it's a, a great offering, and then Mike will reach out to Apple folks and let them know that we're starting this as a sub project and, and invite them. Maybe they'll be interested. Uh, we have three minutes left. Someone wanted, someone asked, I did want to get to this uh, because I know it's, we want to be fair to everyone in terms of access. Someone asked about um, changing the meeting time uh, to support um, basically folks that are in Europe and Middle East and Africa. Um, this is uh, a little bit late. This is, so it starts at 1 p.m. for me. We've got some other folks where this is, is starting at 9 a.m., like I think it's 9 a.m. for Diane. Um, I don't know that we can go, what are people's thoughts? I don't want to direct this conversation. What are people's thoughts about going earlier? I don't think I can go any earlier. Like my days are already kind of sandwiched hard as it is. Like I, I front haul most of my community meetings through the first half of the week. And then the latter half of the week is when I actually get to do other things. Um, and like some of y'all have seen my calendars, like my Mondays and Tuesdays are basically chock full and I basically don't have any more free time left. Uh, so I don't think I can really move it anymore. Um, even though, uh, and like the West Coast folks, I don't think Diane can get up earlier. Yeah, I don't I, think she I, wants I, to get up earlier. I'm in the same time, same time zone as Diane. Uh, we're actually not that far from each other. And uh, uh, it is actually currently at 10 because of daylight savings time. Uh, but then I guess October, whenever we flip back to standard time, it'll go to nine. Right. Uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't be able to make it any earlier. Uh, Diane said quite a while ago that it was impossible negotiating a time in the Red Hat calendar to get it somewhere, which makes it really hard to move. And for folks that don't know, Vadim, this is what, like going on 6 p.m. for you now, is that right? That's more like eight. Uh, <laughs> um, that's acceptable. Moving it later would be very bad. Moving earlier might might make a uh, conflict with my day job meeting. So I'm fine with the time and I can understand that some folks might not be able to make it. Um, I'm pretty sure someone from you can make and do one of these meetings and that means they could hit me or Christian beforehand so we can pass the information and then watch the recording. That's probably the only solution to the stupid time zones we have. Yeah, yeah. well, I, what I suggest is that if, like, if there is enough interest, uh, have a, another meeting. Yeah. Because, like, like although certainly, that sort of fragments things. Well, it, it yeah, would, but I'm I mean, hoping like, we can avoid there's, that. There's 24 time zones plus. Yeah, I realize. And it's impossible to find any time that works. You know, like, like there are more the, than 24 uh, time like, zones. There's, well, there's yeah, enough in the former. I, I know Soviet that. Union. You know, I was being. We like, already, we already have a documentation meeting, so we're already right. spread. Yeah. All right. Let's. I think we're going to stick with where we are for now. This is. I don't mean. I understand that this for some folks it might be difficult. Like Driti just pointed out that it's 11:30 there. Uh, we'll keep it here for now, and we'll come up with a communication mechanism to make sure that people get the recordings after the fact very quickly, and that people who have input into meetings uh, can get input to point people. Um, and their ideas across via point people if they can't make it. I think that's our best compromise for right now. Yes, All yes, right. that would be very helpful. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, folks, we are over right now, so I, I guess it's a good time to end. And thank you so much. This was a hugely productive meeting, and um, I'll get the video up as soon as possible, and I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you all. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.